Good afternoon. My name is David Lake from the office of the CTO uh, at Dell, and I'd like to uh, introduce my colleague as well. Sumit, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Sumit Sathi, I work in uh, the networking and solutions organization in Dell. Um, uh, we've developed NFE and analytics solutions. We are expanding into many other areas, including core network and uh, similar. But let's talk about security today. So let's talk about security. Um, so what I want to do is talk about some aspects of security, um, really from quite a broad set of terms. So this isn't necessarily just technical. Um, we also think that we need to look at some of the societal and environmental concerns that we have around security. And I think one of the things that's quite interesting is that we don't really have a good understanding of what that level of, of protection concerns is. So we've tried to come up with a taxonomy which will allow you to then go back and look and say, okay, yes, I recognize this as a potential attack surface or a vector that could be deployed against us. Then we're going to talk about where to look for attack surfaces in 5G. Um, and you have to remember 5G is this massive all-encompassing set of technologies that doesn't just talk about the technology in the core, but it's talking about the, the delivery of the application and the service across the top of that. We're going to go through three industry verticals as well and talk about some best practices around safety by integrity and then um, close up with some, some conclusions. And we're going, to, we're going to tag team this. So Sumed is doing IoT and healthcare, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, connected vehicles. So let's look at a, 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 tax, a basic taxonomy of security concerns. Really, we can think around this in, in four ways. So there's obviously the personal security. How do you feel? How do you feel um, as an individual, your safety and security and health of yourself, of your family, of your assets and effects that you've got around you? That's obviously one area that we're concerned around. There's the national security side, the security of the nation, the ability for the nation to meet the economic goals that are put in place, the ability to meet the social goals that are put in place. Why are these relevant to 5G? Because 5G is going to connect all these things together. Take that up another level, and we can think about 5G as being across borders, across domains. So there's an international security angle to 5G as well. What's the impact on trade if I enable 5G, I've enabled trade between different places. What are the security levels? What's the, the likely attacks that could impact that as we go through? Re in, international relations. We've got communication channels opened. We're, we're interfer uh, interfacing with other people across different countries. So there's an, an international relations section to this as well that we need to consider. Then there's the corporate security. So we're looking at protection of intellectual property brand. How quickly can an attack that has nothing to do with your organization impact how people perceive that brand and what then happens to that brand. And there's been some, some very, very high profile instances of, of that happening. And then protection of the resources, both the physical resources and the human resources involved in that organization. 5G touches all of these because 5G is going to connect all these things together. It's, it's also at the point where 5G is not a single for purpose network. So we don't have a health and security of the individual network. We have a 5G network that supports an application on top of that that is used for this purpose. That same set of assets, that same network and domain is being used to maybe provide all of these. So we've got some, some interesting challenges here. We've got the, the basic fragility of the network. Now, that doesn't mean that all networks are fragile. It just means that we need to understand how we define that fragility and whether that nature of fragility that we've built in, the availability, the resources, whatever, whether that meets the needs of that application at that time. So that has to be um, thought about. There's also this, this aspect of the law of unintended consequences. As you connect more things together, you're creating this, this mesh of interconnected assets. And that system complexity increases. As the system complexity increases, the chance for something happening somewhere else to impact also increases. We need to look at single points of failure, obviously, but we also need to look around things like um, recovery times. So if I do have a network outage, if I do have a system outage, what is the acceptable uh, recovery time, not just for the app, for the network, but for the service that runs across the top of it? There's a case in the UK a few, few months ago where uh, we lost a couple of, of power generators, and that had a, a, a knock-on effect on other systems across the network. 
not because that system didn't come back quickly, but because the recovery time of the applications themselves was very, very high. There's some RF vulnerabilities in here. Uh, anyone that's, that's got an RF background will know about atmospheric effects, will know about some of the RF-based denial of service that can still be built into that. How do you equate for that? How do you add that into this notion of security? Um, and we can go through this list and see that there's a whole range of aspects here of uh, elements that can be connected together. But what's most important is the way the SDOs are currently working. So if you think of SDOs as being domain experts, it, this then says, well, okay, we've got several domains all connected together here. And some of those domains may not actually just be technological network application domains. They may be about delivering an overall quality of experience. Um, so we need to think about that. Where should we start looking for attack services in 5G? Everywhere. Um, we can look at signaling. So the signaling network itself, um, I'm sure everyone is aware when 2G, uh, in the PSTN as it exists in SS7, there's the ability to exploit various parts of the core of the network to do things that it wasn't intended to do. How many of us get a call every week from someone with a spoofed CLI? Um, all the time. I'm constantly updating my database to try and pull those out. Impossible to do. It can be done. Use a payload. You can go onto the payload. Maybe, maybe you could inject something into the payload. You've exposed a, a surface in one domain that suddenly becomes relevant to another domain. Are we absolutely sure that we have the level of isolation and the level of, of disaggregation that's required to keep these apart? And do you know all the elements that connect across here that enable you to do that? We also have this issue at the moment, certainly within IETF-based protocols, that we have overlay security. Think of IPsec. It's not naturally built into the core of the network. This was added on afterwards. So you're putting a level of trust in something that's external to the, to the infrastructure that's there. The management plane itself can also be open to attack. It can also be open to levels of failure as well. If your management plane fails, what impact does that have on the overall services? So we need to think around some of these interoperability areas. We need to think about focusing on the common features. And, and there's this other aspect that's, that's started to come in. We're seeing crime as being an industry in itself that's very, very organized. This kind of uh, um, denial of service as a service type of attack is, is coming on. And we must think of the, the attack not as something that's an exception, but something that will happen, something that we have exposed, and we need to understand how to, how to work around that. So I'm going to pass over to Sumed. Sumed's going to talk about some of the, the aspects of IoT in a minute. Um, but we'll look at some of the actors that we have here at the moment. There's obviously the criminals that are out there. They're looking to make money. Uh, typically, these will target the billing and charging systems. They're looking to divert profits, revenue from the operator, from the application to themselves. There's this other side as well, the hacktivists. They're becoming much more prevalent. Their aim is, is more uh, to disrupt, to, to spread uh, information that could be um, detrimental to the organization, detrimental to the individual. Um, and it can include things like insider threats, disgruntled former employees. This area is, is rising very, very quickly and is also becoming um, quite prevalent as a service. And obviously, there's the industrial espionage side as well, which we've, we've all been used to seeing for, for many, many years. Again, this is not saying these are new. It's just, okay, what level of tolerance, what level of design do we need to put into this? What level of engineering do we need to put into this to understand how to deliver this service. Sumed, would you like to talk around some of the aspects of IoT? Certainly. <clears throat> so, uh, in a way, if you think about what we are talking about here is, we are imagining that all slicing problems, all the transport problems, all of that has been taken care of, and 5G has been deployed with all the intentions, all the promises that we want to make for different use cases. And let's imagine that the IoT use case, for example, which rides on top of E, uh, on top of MMTC, the massive machine type uh, communication. Let's say that's beginning to happen. 
Um, it's often talked about. In fact, that is, this is one of the driving use cases for 5G. Uh, all the network slice architecture has been put in place. Consumer IoT is commonplace now. You know, heart rate monitors, blood pressure machines, sleep pattern monitors, some of which is either impactful to the individual or, or not. But either way, there is private information, there is important health information about an individual or a group of individuals that could be stolen. This is already commonplace now and will carry forward into the 5G world. Uh, at the same time, one of the areas that people are just beginning to pay attention to is industrial use of uh, IoT. It's beginning to explode. Literally, all kinds of industry verticals are looking at 5G as a way to get more automation into, into their uh, fields of operation. These are often mission critical uh, use cases. High value is at stake. Think nuclear plants, think large national electric players, and, and so on. There is different tolerance for risk compared to 4G and earlier. Uh, in fact, right now with 4G and like technologies, there is not much IoT of these, this kind of critical infrastructure that has been put in place. Most of the nations around the world have drawn very, very stringent uh, constraints around how networks are being used to manage their critical infrastructure. Uh, this is another point that David just made, that service is not just the network itself, it's also the IoT that's being carried as a service, as an OTT service. So now we have to pay attention to not just the telecom service and the security of the telecom service and the infrastructure, but also the IoT layer that's riding on top of why we, because we are making uh, promises so that that layer is, is of value to the customers of 5G. Some of the big questions, and in a way, in this talk, what we are doing is raising these big questions. We are imagining that 5G is here, it has been deployed, it is successful. Now, asking these big questions to the community here and continue to do so is going to get us to a point where this infrastructure, these services are far more secure. What are the problems that we see? The big problem today is most of the IoT sensors lack resources to manage communications. A lot of the times, you are not going to see even a full-blown TCP stack built into these devices. Why? They just don't have the, power, the, the capacity to process packets. Uh, not enough memory, you know, not enough buffering, for example. The operating environments, operating uh, systems are uh, uh, varied. That means there is less homogeneity. That means more vulnerabilities can be and will be exploited. Then the implications of DOS-like attacks. And this is where we are going to focus initially in the IoT world. Why? Because we expect these to be in the millions, if not billions. If you catch hold and uh, get one IoT network under your control, if you are the hacker, you will be able to bring down pretty much the rest of the network as well. Just the scale itself is enormous, and I'm going to talk about one example of how, uh, how this might happen. Just a quick big list of uh, industrial IoT forum that they have published many, many use cases. And only the ones that, that I have shown in red color here, let's talk a little bit about those, smart grid. We all want our grid to be smart. Why? That's where the efficiencies are. We want to reduce our use of uh, fossil fuels. That means having a smart grid, allowing us to control how we produce energy is very important. If this smart grid falls under the control of the right or wrong guys, why? Because the IoT is now riding on a network that may or may not be designed to be secure, we have a big problem. Industrial security systems, who gets in, who gets out, is something that needs to be controlled. Easy place to hack, and then that lets you, that is a bad guy, to uh, enter the industrial areas where you don't want them going. Nuclear power plant monitoring. Uh, a tsunami happens, unfortunately, if that is the case, we need very, very reliable ways to ma monitor those plants. But at the same time, if a hack happens that uh, sends, starts sending out alarms as if there were a tsunami, we have an even bigger problem. When there is no need, we are going to divert emergency resources to such places. Industrial heating, ventilation, air conditioning, uh, these look like benign, but if you change the behavior from the normal to the abnormal, or vice versa, you have a big problem on your hands. All this is expected to ride on top of 5G because of that M MTC uh, uh, slice that we are defining for it. 
uh, natural gas, ozone temperature monitoring, and others. Uh, real quick here now, all security, if you think about it, flows from two principles. One is I need a, uh, a source of trust, root of trust, and that root of trust is handed from a trusted agent to the trusted agent to the trusted agent. If that principle is, is invalidated, we have a problem. The other problem is known unknowns versus unknown unknowns. If you know that there are areas of security that are not known to you, you try to mitigate them. You try to plan for them, work around them. If, on the other hand, you don't know which are the unknown unknowns, you have a bigger problem. Let a failure happen, and every such failure is going to tell you about a new unknown unknown, and the next time you're going to prepare for it. That is where we are with respect to 5G. So 5G-based delivery of IoT services enabled. Which of the uh, aspects are more, more vulnerable? Let's have that conversation. Let's uh, start asking these questions. Which aspects have known implications and the unknown unknowns? At all levels and corners of society, we are going to have every person, every individual pretty much in the world now touched by these security concerns. Very, very quickly, uh, this is an example of an IoT botnet from 2016. Well published, well, well understood. This happened over 4G networks. Uh, Mirai is the name of the botnet. It was very, very simple for Mirai to exploit millions of devices. Scanned for IP addresses and known ports, found vulnerable devices, installed and linked, uh, uh, installed itself and links uh, that were necessary for it to receive the commands. Uh, then it sent in, uh, sent instructions uh, to launch a DDoS, basically, and then you can uh, you know if you essentially uh, they go went after many many types of floods, SYN, ACK, DNS, GRE, UDP, Stomp, all kinds of floods, just to saturate the network. And this is pre 5G, and essentially they closed ports 22 and 23. Why? Because they could control those devices. With port 22, your SSH access was uh, was terminated, and 23, your telnet, yeah, you couldn't get in. So once that happens. The, the, the botnet got in and you couldn't get into that device and that device is now controlling a, a much larger swath of IoT devices. Uh, all types of devices and types were exploited by this botnet. And as it turned out, it won by volume and scale. This was 2016, one terabit per second bandwidth consumption, essentially bringing down a large IoT network to its knees is how it won. That leads us to very, very high level questions, but these need to be asked over and over and over. Can a botnet like this bring down other slices? We are operating on MMTC. Can it bring down the URLLC uh, uh, slices on which a robotic surgery might be being carried out or a connected vehicle may be being uh, operated? Vehicles might get into, get, get into accident-like situations. Can, can it bring down entire 5G networks? Are there corners of the 5G network state that will reach because of these kinds of DDoS attacks that will bring down, make the entire network in operation, uh, operational? Wi-Fi uh, 6 was being talked about earlier today and, and yesterday. Uh, can it affect, there will be cascading effects of uh, 5G failing and then transitioning that risk over. Very, very quickly, similar cases happen, are going to happen in healthcare. Let me just focus on these couple of areas. We understand healthcare implications, the telehealth, which is an extremely important application that will open up uh, opportunities to, to get healthcare to parts of the society around the world where they don't have good access to healthcare. Underserved populations, battlefield situations, continuous monitoring, reduced cost, and then cross-ecosystem real-time collaboration will be enabled. And this is the promise of 5G that we are talking about. But the flip side is the new security concerns. These devices are going to be, going to be pervasive and talking to uh, people's health, and people's health is going to be carried over them. There are way too many to track. Uh, the transport itself could double as man in the middle. There will be side channel information that will be captured from the transport that may give the attackers enough of a clue to attack your healthcare uh, uh, services. Scale of connections, the amount of data itself is going to be huge. The fragility of the infrastructure will open up more uh, uh, problems to, uh, for, for attack. The connectivity graph is going to be huge. I'm just trying to uh, rush a little bit here. Uh, finally, let's get to the most important questions. If this leads to loss of uh, limb and life, who is responsible? 
the person who loses uh, his or her life and the limb, they certainly are not expecting this to be a side effect of this new great new technology called 5G. What is the notion of a risk and how do you calculate that risk? How do you know which uh, component failed and what was the cascading effect? How do you dish out the risk as it goes along? And who, who underwrites this risk? Is the taxpayer going to be on the hook around the world to, to underwrite this risk? So is 5G going to need this kind of underwriting just to be enabling telehealth-like applications? You know, something to consider. You know, as policymakers talk about it, something to consider. Legislation might be needed in place. At this point, I'm going to hand it back to David, who is going to talk about connected vehicles and uh, bring it back to other aspects of security. So I was going to talk about this until I got a different car last week. But this is, this is really interesting, because if we look at all the uh, attack vectors that I've suddenly opened up in terms of connected vehicles, look at it. Um, are we absolutely sure that something coming in on a Bluetooth connection here can't make its way through, not necessarily to the car, but think what's back end connected to that car. Someone's offering a vehicle, a connected vehicle service, way, way back in the, in the cloud across one of these connections. So I was going to talk about this until I got a car last week. It was delivered without Apple's CarPlay. I want Apple CarPlay. Um, I want Apple CarPlay, but I was not prepared to pay for it when I bought the car. So what did I do? I, I went on eBay, of course, and looked for a service that would promise to recode my car to enable Apple CarPlay for $35. Great. How was it delivered? It was delivered on a USB stick. What did I do with that USB stick? Simple. I plugged it straight in the ODB port here. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? It's an incredibly bad idea. I don't know what that's going to do. So I don't know that someone coming in here is not going to have worked out for $35 that they can bypass some bus system here and provide a service that's going to disable, maybe not me, but maybe someone 4,000 miles away in another vehicle. So the attack may be happening here but the implication of it could be somewhere, somewhere else. How do we think about this? Well, in engineering terms, we don't, but we need to. Because what I've done, you, you could look at this on engineering principles. You could look at the, the possible sets of interconnectivity that I've got between these nodes and work out all the permutations and combinations and work out what could happen. It's very difficult to do. Um, but it could be done, and it's something that we need to consider. Um, by the way, the, the $35 was, was thrown away because, of course, it was on eBay and it didn't work anyway. But, you know, what did, what did I expect? So there are a number of aspects here within the vehicles of today. This is just where we are today in terms of connectivity that I have within the vehicle. Um, my, my son's just learned to drive and he has a GPS system that's connected to the OB, ODB port. I can go on to the web, onto a website and check exactly where he's been, how fast he's driving, and everything else. A huge amount of personal information there that's suddenly made uh, available. So we have this today. We have ODB. We have, we have a CD. Um, how many people use CDs in the car? Very, very few. What can it be used for? It can be used to rewrite the RAM within the CD player. You can put software on a CD that gets into the system of the car. Can that get to the bus? Can that get from the bus to another sensor? Can they get to another wireless network? We don't know. We just don't know. So we need to understand and mitigate for some of these. Maybe there's insurance that needs to be written in here to understand that. So if we look at the um, connected vehicles, we also have these two different ideas. So we have the, the Renault, Toyota, Hyundai, who are looking at vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle systems. But then we have the other telco sides that are looking at long-range cellular. Are these two going to come together? Are they complementary? Are they, are they likely to, to cause issues with each other? If I have a vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle system here that suddenly connects across a long-range system to another vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle system, what's the implication? What's the implication in terms of, of the drivability of vehicles and the, the, the issues that could happen with data across there? So <laughs> we now have all the standard issues that we're used to with IT, the DDoS attacks, the malware, now applies to the vehicles. These, this 
console in my car that still doesn't have Apple CarPlay um, is, is now vulnerable in some way. I know it's vulnerable. I put the USB stick in, I saw the light flash on the USB stick, so I know data was being read off that. Someone will attack that. The vehicle is accessible, so the cloud service itself is accessible. So we need to think about that scope of, of attack, not just from the network, but from the applications across the other side of it. And we end up with this, this loop of p potential attack surfaces which are opened up simply by saying, okay, we have a single network substrate in terms of 5G that we've opened up. For good reason, we need to understand that. So we've got the human impact, the commercial in impact, and the, the numbers of virtual uh, points of potential failures are much, much higher. Somehow we need to start accounting for that. The problem we have is the solution as seen by the consumer is actually a combination of multiple elements. It's not I'm buying a text service from my, from my cell carrier. I'm buying a vehicle service, which by the way, is also giving me email, it's giving me WhatsApp, it's giving me streaming media, it's giving me all these other things. So my service as a consumer is now not just one thing, it's all of these things. So we need a way of taking all of these areas in terms of the physical infrastructure, the networking, the users, the applications, and understanding how these are all related together. It's a complex problem, but it means we need to start looking at this as an impact on the users. We need to understand the risk associated with this. And there will be some areas where we say mitigating that risk is not worth looking at. So a general public use here, I may not bother to, to mitigate against that risk. That may be something I can live with. A high risk at the top would be something that I need to mitigate against. And we need an engineering construct to understand how to build that. Um, and that engineering must include elements of the human impact uh, and the insurance impact as well. We don't have that today. Oh, who's saying this? A number of people are saying this, that there's a lack of precision in 3GPP today, um, which means that we have security gaps. Does that mean 3GPP should go out and fix all the security gaps? No, because it's not all in their domain. So we need to think about this as a systems problem. I'm just gonna take through, through this very, very quickly and just say that don't forget the traditional attacks. Most of these will go unnoticed, um, but we know about them, we deal with them, we understand them. So we already have systems in place mostly to deal with those attacks today. It's the impact of that attack as it gets uh, more connected and, and more diverse. So we lack an end-to-end -end approach today on security of the application. Yes, we, we address it in each element, but we must learn to balance these risks, this risk appetite against the trade-off. So it may be that in some instances I want to increase the security and I need to design that in. Um, we may be able to look at artificial intelligence to provide augmented modeling systems here to actually go through and say, okay, we know what's gonna happen, we understand the combination or we understand the past, and therefore we can use that to help us design and model better. Uh, we then probably need to look at network visualization, actually taking real-time information from all of these applications and networks, putting them back through the model, and using that to refine our, our risk and reward curve. But I think what I'll leave you with is, is this idea that we need to start looking at this as uh, an end-to-end -end problem, because 5G connects applications and users together. It's not just connecting devices together. And we must think of this as a security, not just as a technical level, but as a societal level. I'll leave that with you. And if anyone's got any idea of what I should do with my USB key in the, in the car, thank you very much. I should take better advice. If you've got any questions, be pleased to take them. Thank you very much. On the mobile devices, can you hear me? Mm. Hello. So on the mobile devices, we still have that. Um, we are more secure, let's say, uh, based on the um, the kind of the OS that you run, right? The more open, the more vulnerable, right? But the more closed in that sense, mm -hmm. right? And more validated and more hardened, 
the less the attack surface. What do you think of that in terms of you know the connected cars, IoT, or whatever different application use cases are out there? I mean, I'm saying, is it a network problem or is it on a device or a client problem? I, I, I think it's an application problem. So I think we need to look at it from an application perspective. What, what level of application security do you want to have? Are, are, are you able to tolerate? And then we need a method of really instantiating that through the entire infrastructure. So if you, if you look at what you do with a, with a mobile device today, essentially I put data in across S1, it pops out the other side at SGI, and then I deal with it. I, I don't have any marker on that data to tell me how valuable that data is to me as an individual, or what the security level of that data should be. In fact, the network is completely, completely blind to it. So the question then is, okay, if the, if the network's completely blind, does that mean they don't have any responsibility for, tra for carrying that traffic? So let's say it's a connected vehicle, and I need that information for real-time driving, and packets get lost. Are, is the network gonna stand back and just say, didn't know that was connected car vehicles um, data, so nothing to do with me. I, I don't know. I, I sense that where we're going with 5G, we're not going to be able to do that. We expect a delivery um, criteria across that, which means we need the constructs to do that. And we, we, that's what we lack at the moment. And in a way, that last point on David's slide is the answer to that. We need that coordination and mindset between different domains. So application domains, operating system domains, hardware, protocols, that SDOs being aware, I think that's where we need yeah. to go. Great yeah. question. That, yeah. that coordination yeah. is where we need to go. Yeah, because that, that domain could be the connected vehicle operator. <laughs> it's tough. I, I completely agree. I, I'm sure it's very, very hard. Uh, I think it goes back to the unknown unknowns point that I was making earlier. In a situation like that, either you figure out what the known unknowns are and try to mitigate them, and then you wait for the unknown unknowns to show up. Uh, you can watch other areas where similar cases, use cases, may have been deployed, and you might, might find an answer. Security follows the, that route of trust, and then handing off that trust from one party to the other next, and then the known unknowns or unknown unknowns. Those are the two models by which you can really define security and then execute security. In this case, it, I, it feels like you have some known unknowns, but the unknown unknowns are probably your uh, biggest area of concern. So, I'm going to leave it there. So th there's another another aspect of, of Sigfox. This is not this is not something against Sigfox or, or, or any of the operators at all what level of confidence can they give you that they're able to handle your data? It's a shared service. So from a resource perspective, it's limited. It's also an RF service. So the RF will in some area, in some instances be impacted. Can they, can they deal with that? Is that something that they offer? Probably not today, but in the future, could they say, well, you know, for this price, we'll give you a best effort service. For this price, we'll give you a, a silver service. For this price, we'll give you a, a platinum gold service. The question then is, can they overlay security with that? And as well as offering you, you know, how, how do you build a definition of service? It, it's all down to how much you value that, that data transaction. Yeah, and, and again, that will be wrapped with a service level, which, you know, is, it's very difficult. If, if you send an email, what, what value do you put on the email? I, I don't know. You know. Sometimes if I'm asking someone for something that I want immediately, um, I, I value that email very highly, but I have no way of defining that to the network today to say this is important and I am prepared to put more resources against it in order that it's delivered against the SLA that's important for me personally. And we seem to have that disconnect at the moment between the, the technological level and the, the human level of this is my data and, and I, I assign some, some quality to it. Thank you. <laughs>